Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Caravan of Garbage, where, yes, we are continuing our Alan Morathon, Mason. That's right, folks. You're out there. You get, get yourself your classic eggy in a bready. <laughs> cook it up, that classic British dish. Wasn't it and egg, settle down. Eggy in a basket? Yeah, wasn't probably. It? I don't know. Yeah. That's not what it's called. But it, uh, as far as I know, it's not a, a, a traditional British no. dish. What they are thinking of or what they should have put in all those scenes, those multiple scenes where it appears, is, is obviously frog in a pond. <laughs> v should have delivered to Evie uh, uh, a chocolate frog in a in a big green jello. Traditional English breakfast. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, of course, this week we are talking about an adaptation of Alan Moore's V for Vendetta, and I would say of all the adaptations that we've seen that are movies, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this is my favourite. Interesting. It's not perfect, but I feel like there's a real momentum to this. Okay. I get the message. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I see the guy and he's shouting and he's banging his fists and there's the signs behind him and okay. I'm like, hmm, I think I get this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, please leave a like if you get it too. Oh, this is about like a used car salesman or something? I think so. I'll put you in a used Toyota Camry today. What will it take for me to jam you in this Camry? Jamry in you into a Camry. That's good. What do you think of it, though? Well, what I mean, what I think I'm getting from previous weeks and also this episode is that the main mistake in attempting to adapt an Alan Moore project generally is mm. there's always so much to them. Yeah. And the, and Hollywood's like, yeah, we can knock this out in two hours. We can take ten issues. Mm. And it's it's not like a... And also add stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's not like it's, you know, a standard issue superhero fair where it can be... You can take a ten issue storyline and most of it is just... Uh, they encounter the bad guy and then they tie or lose and then they upgrade their armour. Their lasers. Their lasers and armour and then they come back and win ultimately and, and in the interim there's just various bits of interchangeable dialogue that you can remove or change as necessary. Yeah. This is 10 issues and I feel like it is all essential, the original. Yep. And why not just chop it out, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Want to chop it out and sanitize it and add another subplot and whatever. But yeah, I think there's still a lot of things that I enjoy about this, even if it's not right, okay. for lack of a better word. I like the characterization of V. Like the look, I mean, the, the look is from the comic. Sure, yes. Right? Like the personality, his physicality. I like the cadence of Hugo Weaving, whether he's, you know, reciting Shakespeare or just being like. I'm saying egg, egg in basket or whatever. <laughs> sure. Whatever he's saying, I enjoy it. <laughs> sure, he's a little dramatic. Yeah. And sure. You know, he's always... Settle down, He needs to settle God. down. Sometimes he'll pass a poster and he's like, I'm going to put a, I'm gonna scratch a big V into this. Mm-hmm. Settle down, mate. But the fact that you don't see him at all, mm-hmm. real. I mean, there's the, there's like the silhouette, you know, with the fire and whatever. But, you know, you get a lot of emotion out of just the mask and apparently that's also done from just different lighting techniques because uh-huh. they're like, should we change the mask when he's feeling different emotions? And I think it's okay. better that they, they didn't do that. Mm. Yeah. What would they do, a live switcheroo? Yeah, someone okay. just runs in, <laughs> upset. Just someone in theatre blacks just runs in, <laughs> yeah. switches the mask on. Yeah, off. and it's like the tragedy comedy mask. You know, you just, okay, you just yeah, switch yeah. them over. Oh, yeah. do you think he'd have multiple masks on his head and just sort of awkwardly tilt them around? Oh, that's good. What's that? Uh, the, the Living he- Tribunal? Oh, yeah, I was going to say the He Man character, but yes. But Hugo Weaving, you probably know this, he didn't start filming this. Was it. James Purefoy? It was. Yeah, okay. Pennyworth's own. Oh, Keep that in your head. That'll come back we're later. We're coming I back think, to maybe. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, we're going to come back at this. There's a TV show called Pennyworth, <laughs> in case people are wondering. Yeah, Actually, yeah. that's not true. It's called Pennyworth, the origin of Batman's butler. That's right. Keep that in your head. Keep that in your head. You'll need it. You'll need it. it. And also, we're going to talk about why Alan Moore hates this one specifically. But So he was cast originally and he shot for four weeks, but then was replaced by Hugo Weaving because he just he wasn't yelling with it. But he's in it a lot. He was dubbed over. Oh, I see. So right. a lot of this, and you can't tell, mm. is is not Hugo Weaving. Sick. And also stunt work, et cetera, and so forth, you know? And also, speaking of, I remember this having more action in it than what it does. Okay. Like, he does some fighting at the start, uh-huh, sure, and sure, then sure. there's a lot of torture and kind of walking around buildings and murdering priests and whatever. All of those are kinds of action, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, that's true. And then at the end, he does his big karate thing at the end. Sure, you know? yes, that is and true. I, but I like that, and I think the combat on the whole is very good, and this is obviously because the director of this worked on the Matrix movies as a right. second unit director. And this was also written by the Wachowskis, or at least co-written by them? Yes. Yeah, partially, yeah. I mean, most of it was Alan Moore, I think. Sure, I think he the did. The good bits. Yeah, the good bits, certainly. But it does feel... Like, even though it does get some Britishisms wrong, Mm -hmm. it gets a lot of it right. And I feel like the fact that the lead cop in this 
is just some schlubby dude who was probably in the bill at one point. Okay. I think that works as opposed well, to... Well, one like, of them is, is uh, Sherlock's nemesis. Well, that's true. No, one of them is Sherlock's, the inspector. Yeah, I like to think of him as his nemesis. Yeah, okay. His <laughs> stupid nemesis. <laughs> yeah. Looking at evidence, Sherlock, not on my watch. <laughs> oh, you've solved it. Well, I look like a fool. Yeah, thanks, I guess. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I'm like, it really feels out of place that there are just these two good cops and they're trying to do their best here. It's like... Well, there's a theory that the second cop, the one from Sherlock, is actually an inside man. Right. Because a lot of the things V does in this are completely inexplicable. Sure. And the only way that he or she or they would know what was happening is if there was somebody close enough to be feeding them information. Yeah, right. And I know V probably has police scanners and all of that, uh-huh. but... There is a pretty solid theory that at least one of those cops, probably the second one, is is helping. You're saying a theory or an attempt to paper over plot holes? You decide. <laughs> that one, I've already decided. <laughs> I decided before you finish the sentence. <laughs> yeah. Also, something that I didn't care for in this uh, in this movie is uh, it's pretty nice, isn't it? The whole world's pretty nice. Oh, you mean in terms of like this, this fascist... Yeah, this this, this fascist dictatorship, everybody's got like a nice house and a nice apartment and a big TV and every time it cut to uh, someone, you know, a family in a, in a nice terrace cottage, I'm like, oh, a lot of space. <laughs> a lot of space in this... Uh, in London, right? Of all places. <laughs> looks quite looks quite lovely, whereas in the, you know, the, I feel like the entire... Yeah, the comic is not as... No, it's... There's it's, more this kind of... And there's a seedy underbelly of society. Yeah. And, and we get a little bit of that, but and not No, really. but I mean, this, this, I mean, the fascist part seems to have come from a completely different movie. Right, yeah. Where they're like, we've got to crack down on this and we're going to... The people are rioting in the streets. No, they're not. They're, they're, they're all watching their TV and going, for sure. For sure. Evie, at the start of the comic book, is uh, about to, you know, go out on the streets and try to make a living as a lady of the night. Yeah, and uh, she's 16. Yeah, 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 because life has been so hellish for her. And in this, she just... Just works at a TV station or something. Yeah, well, they had their same... It's pretty nice. She's got a nice little blouse on. Absolutely. But they had the same backstory in mm. the comic. Like, her parents were you know, were taken away for, you know, for speaking out against the government. And it's the same thing here, except here she's just like, she's doing all right, yeah. yeah. But I think the idea of that was, you know, you put her in the same building, then V can come in, and then that's a whole... That, sure. that whole thing can, can really kick off. John Hurt, it was in 1984. And now he's, he's... Now he's big brother. He's become the thing. Oh, makes you think, doesn't he it? Say, he said he wouldn't do it, remember? In the mm-hmm. movie and book. He yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. I hate 1984. This sucks. <laughs> right. But look, look at him now. This is the worst possible year to be in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here's a few of the changes that they made. Just a few. You, okay. We mentioned uh, okay, Evie and, and, and her, you know, her story and character has and changed. And it's quite nice. It's quite nice. Everything's quite nice. Quite significantly. Uh, there's no chemical attack either. Subplot, or not even subplot. It's like the plot of this. The big yes. secret reveal is at the end of this. That the chemical warfare, which caused Britain to turn to fascism mm-hmm. was actually, it was internal. Yes. It was coming from inside the Britain. That's right. And <laughs> and that's what caused them to rise to it power. It was coming from inside the old bill. Yeah. And this is one of Alan Maud's... It's coming from inside a Greg's? <laughs> sure. A Tesco's. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about this. One of the things Alan Moore doesn't like about this is V, in, in the comic book, he's less about freedom and he's more about just... Anarchy. anarchy. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Whoops, my anarchy symbol. And so, yeah, you don't get that sense of all. He's just... Because there's even a moment at the start, and it's very different in the comic than it is in the movie. In the movie, he goes on television and he's like, don't you think something's wrong? Don't you think maybe we should do something about it? And I'll see you in a year and everybody can rise up. But in the comic book, he's like... Fuck you. What are you doing? This is your fault, everybody. Uh, How did you let this happen? Yeah. Another another thing that is different, uh, speaking of when he goes into the TV studio, another thing that is different is this proliferation of Guy Fawkes masks across the entire community. Mm. It, that's a new thing for the movie, whereas it's not. There's, there's just the one yeah. in the comic book, which to me... Makes it, it makes the cops seem even dumber because this is introduced quite early on in the movie and at no point they're like, should we maybe... See if we can find out who made a really big order of Guy Fawkes masks. <laughs> what was so, it? Eight hundred thousand plus or yeah, something? Yeah, something like that. They don't really know. How did how do you get enough to you know put on all this TV crew here? It's uh, maybe we should look into that. Yeah, there's no other clues. There's yeah, that. yeah, there's that. Oh, that would yeah. be the first thing I would. Yeah, there's, do. there's literally only one place that makes those. Maybe handmade makes them. Yes, he does a lot of things. Eight hundred thousand. Well, he does a lot of things because the first hundred are pretty good, and the remaining are just. <laughs> He's just gotten a bit like an exercise book and he's drawn one on a page and then just cut around yeah, it. No eye holes. No eye holes. Yeah. You make your own eye holes. Well, that's like a, a big part of this character is that he's he, she, they. And we'll talk about the identity 
of who this person might be. It is very busy. For one, uh, built like a like a little prison corridor. Mm-hmm, sure. Their hideout, which mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy. Uh, not to mention like working on voices and masks and all of those different things so you can play different personas, mm-hmm. plus, you know, copyright gear and various other things. Dancing, sword play, kung fu and the like, all of these things. Uh, it's astounding. Any, any member of the constabulary can stand up to V. You know, he's so good at... Fighting that empty knight's armor. <laughs> He's just having fun. He's just having He's fun. Just having fun. fun. Yeah, but also chemically enhanced, He's enhanced and, sure, and all yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, he also rebuilt that train tunnel by, <laughs> by himself. And also, as mentioned, manufactured and sent out. It was several hundred thousand masks. That's what they mentioned. They say upwards of. So mm. who really knows? And then, of course, there's the Domino's thing. Like, that's not nothing. Mm. Uh, I've got some trivia about that. But yeah, it was like 200 hours of Domino placement. To make yeah, that right. Uh-huh. But that to me, impl- and that would have been a whole crew of disgruntled union uh, prop guys, <laughs> no doubt. So, but you know? but that to me also implies that in this movie, at least, and sure, this might be papering over, that V is more than one person. Mm. And so there's a few theories about their identity. So I'll, I'll be happy to get into a couple right Please. now. And obviously, it's different for the comics and the movies and, and etc. Because I think by this movie giving V the voice of Hugo Weaving Mm -hmm. and you see the body like burning in the fire. Uh I think it takes away a lot of the ambiguity because in the comics, Mm. all of the clues left and all the backstory we get about who this person can be, some of the evidence could be planted or fake or misinformation. And you never hear a voice. No, you never hear a voice. So it doesn't definitively mark it as as one particular character, yeah. That's right. And it's so it's very much unknown in the comics, even more so who this person is. And the point, I guess, of this character is, and they say it in the movie. It could be you or me. It could be you or me. It's supposed to be, it could be Steve. Is it you? No, it's not me. Okay, you're not under arrest. (laughs) Thank God. I got away with that one, didn't I? Are you V for Vendetta? You've got to say if you're V for (laughs) Vendetta. That's the rules. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, yeah, the idea is that V, like Batman... Mm-hmm. <laughs> now I'm interested. Is, a, ...is an idea. So, again, it's not supposed to be important. V is a symbol, an idea, not a person. But here are some working theories. Okay, right? sure. Uh, v is a member of Evie's family. Uh, there's, it's even mentioned in the, you know, she thinks maybe it's her father. Mm-hmm. Alan Moore has come out and said definitively, no, that's okay. not the case. For has, his he de- has he debunked all of these? No, no, just that fun. one, yeah. Okay, right. V could also be... Five, as in V. So a member of the British boy band Five. That's right. Do you think abs? Do you think it might have been abs? I'm quickly Googling. I'm trying to remember another member of the band Five. Let's go. Okay. If you're getting down, baby. baby. I'm on it now, baby. Come and get it now, baby. Sean, Richie, Scott, abs, J. J. Could be J. For Vendetta. J J for Gendetta. But I think that idea of there being five of this person makes sense from like a logistical point of view. Sure. Because maybe one's good at combat. Maybe one's just on the police radio. Maybe maybe one's digging that tunnel out. Maybe Maybe one's one's just for the dominoes. Maybe one's got abs. Maybe one's got... uh, One of them would definitely have abs. Mm. But I think the theory that I like the most, Mm -hmm. which is very much not confirmed, is that Valerie's partner who was taken, Yes, is V. Right. And through various experiments and, and hormones and the like, that's why there's the shrine. That's probably the theory that I like the most. Mm-hmm. But also, I like that they never tell you who it is. Yeah, okay, Because then sure. you, can, you can be like me and be like, well, I think it's this. And someone else can be like, well, you're wrong. Can wow. I, and I can be like, well, that's just your opinion, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then the uh, film studio can come out there and be like, yeah, everybody's talking about us, everybody's buying those DVDs. <laughs> also, there are a couple of moments that break the illusion of, you know, that it is a normal man under the mask. Oh, yes. Uh, you can see when V is fighting the suit of armour, mm-hmm. you actually, there's a moment where the head lifts up and you can see, like, the jaw underneath and it's just, like, regular skin. Right, right, right. And, and, it's, and you can see Hugo weaving signature Hugo tattoo that yes. has under his jaw. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the moment where Evie is kidnapped, mm-hmm. you can see... The eyes of, of V. Right, it's like yeah, a huh. stunt man or whatever, mm. but anyway. Have you got more things to say before it's green trivia? And to the supercut of that guy yelling Rodney. Oh, yeah, maybe they'll leave that till the end. Oh, to, after this time? I think so, yeah, yeah. Mix it up a little bit. Keep it fresh. I don't like it. And this. for new, new viewers might be like, what are they talking about? Stick gotta around. Gotta stick around. You gotta stick around. Gotta stick around. Uh, a professional barber was brought in to shave Natalie Portman's head, put on the V gloves and whatever, uh-huh. and uh, they did it in one take with three cameras. Huh. That's good. Yeah. You don't want to mess that up. Nah. nah. You can't really mess up a shaved head. No, I that's mean, I true. guess you can get the hair caught in yeah. the thing, you know, <laughs> and be like, ow, you're pulling. Ah, yeah, stop. Yeah. Ah, 
Ha! Ow! I'm Natalie Portman. I'm famous. I'm important. How dare you? I'll, you're fired. This is the year of Revenge of the Sith. This is a big year for me. Ah! Uh, while shooting the fight in Victoria Station, the stuntmen moved in slow motion on set while David Leach... Hugo Weaving stunt double, who's now a director. Oh, he did Bullet Train more recently. I see. He moved in real time and it was shot in 60 frames per second to slow everything down further. Fascinating. The domino scene where V, Hugo Weaving, mm -hmm. tips over black and red dominoes to form a giant letter V mm -hmm. involved 22,000 dominoes and, as mentioned, took 200 hours plus four professional domino assemblers. So that speaks to there being also one V running around digging tunnels doing karate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Four other Vs setting up dominoes. Setting up dominoes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, the dominoes used weren't regulation dominoes and had to be made custom for the film huh. in order to have the appropriate weight to fall at a specific speed. So the material used was actually harvested from an Australian eucalyptus species commonly referred to as a blue gum which actually led to the working title of this film, Mason. Yeah, go on. You're not going to believe this. I'm listening. <laughs> it was actually Actually called Blue Harvest. <laughs> wow. Uh, which, funnily enough, by coincidence, was the working title of the original Star Wars from 1977. Incredible work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Again, the hardest you work all week, I think. <laughs> In, uh, I looked up types of trees. So, like, what's a blue, blue gub, obviously? Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, Joel Silver actually started to develop this film, and I want to talk about him a little bit more. Stanley Kubrick was offered to direct, but he turned it down in order to do films mainly stuck in development hell. So I think that would have been a very interesting combination of people. Agreed. Stanley, I feel like Stanley Kubrick and Alan Moore could sit down and just, I don't know whether they'd get along or they'd, or they'd start hate each other, hitting maybe. each other with pint glasses. <laughs> right? I don't know. What is that? We'll never know we'll now. We'll never know, yeah. God damn. If only I had a time machine. For other reasons, I probably wouldn't bother setting that yeah, up. Yeah, it seems yeah. like a massive waste of resources if you... <laughs> Used it for that, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rodney! 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 Uh, box office for this. Made on a budget of $54 million, mm -hmm. and at the box office itself, it made $132.5 million, which is pretty good, moderate success, but not a smash hit by any sure. stretch. Mm -hmm. But anyway, forget all that. Forget money. I'm, I'm going not to. about money. And V for Vendetta isn't about money either. It's true. It's v about anarchism. It's and, about anarchism. And eggies and, and breadies. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And metaphors and whatever. Sure, Shakespeare yeah. and big explosions. And you, you scratch a sign, you scratch a V into it. And about a man who I'll never forget. Oh, you reckon? You reckon, Natalie Portman, <laughs> you won't forget this guy who blew up London? <laughs> you, you sure you won't forget this guy who imprisoned you? Oh, you won't forget him. Wow, that's really, really something. Makes you think, doesn't it? It does. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So Alan Moore was very critical of the movie for changing what he called the anarchy versus fascism structure of the graphic novel into what he saw was an exploration of American neoliberalism versus American neoconservatism. So he said, as a result of this, why not just set this in the US instead of Britain? Like, you're telling a US-centric story. Yeah, yeah. That's what this should be. Mm -hmm. But I love the British. And they were all like, God damn it, why didn't he, why didn't he criticise us early? We should have done that. People would have hated that. Yeah. They could have replaced Stephen Fry with Jack Black. High fidelity yet. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Book set in London and movie set in Chicago? Mm. I don't know. You're the only person I could turn to. <laughs> That's what he sounds like. Yeah. That's what he sounds like. Yeah. Producer Joel Silver said at a press conference that screenwriter Lana Wachowski had talked with Moore and that Moore was very excited about what Lana had to say. So Moore disputed this, reporting that he told Wachowski, I didn't want anything to do with films. I wasn't interested in Hollywood, and he demanded that DC Comics force Warner Brothers to issue a public retraction and apology for Silver's blatant lies. And although Silver called Moore directly to apologise, there was no public retraction. But then Silver said later that he was actually referring to a meeting that had taken place about the rights 20 years earlier. So, yeah. And speaking of... Sure, okay. So the, there's a New York Times article where they spoke to David Lloyd, you might know as the artiste on this work. Oh, of course, yes. And this was his reaction to the movie's production. He also found it difficult to sympathise with Mr. Moore's protests. When he and Mr. Moore sold the film rights to the comic book, Mr. Lloyd said, We didn't do it innocently. Neither myself nor Alan thought we were signing it over to a board of trustees who would look after it like it was the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that has been a common complaint, mm. and I've seen in the comments here, like, well, if he didn't want the things that he owned or had more ownership over to, you know, to be adapted, he shouldn't have sold off the rights, etc., and so mm. forth. But, you know... You can still be like, this sucks. For like sure, he's, he's allowed to do that. Yeah. And he's taken his name off 
most of the work, you know, that have been adapted because he's like, this is no good and I don't like it, yeah, Mason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that, you know, a, a lot of that, that I think speaks to the larger picture of like the comic book industry where a lot of, you know, there there is definitely a huge power imbalance between creators and the comic book companies. Yeah, definitely. Like maybe that when you, when you agreed to work for one of the big companies, they were just like, and we're going to adapt this yeah. uh, whether you like it or not. So shut so, up. So shut up. Yeah. You know, or you can, or you can... Go somewhere else. That's right. Now, this might not be the last we'll see of V for Vendetta, Mason. What? So, would you like perhaps a sequel? A second Vendetta, perhaps? Oh, yeah, maybe. Anyway, there's no sequel in the works. Don't even worry about it. Oh. But there was a series planned that uh, went into development hell in the 2010s. But, of course, yeah, to circle back around to Pennyworth, the origins of Batman's butler. That's right. The showrunner Danny Canyon confirmed that Pennyworth would also serve as a loose prequel to V for Vendetta, with the British Civil War depicted in the first season, eventually leading to the formation of Norse Fire, the government in V for Vendetta. Which is crazy. And yeah. makes me think for even a split second of my life, I might consider watching Pennyworth. Mm. I've heard it's all right. I've heard it's all right. So, so there's a there's a British Civil War, which obviously never happened. So this is a this is a parallel universe. Yeah, but I'm pretty Does sure. Does that mean that? This Batman is going to be born into a parallel uh, universe? Yes. Or is there no Batman in this? In which case, the, the moniker of the origin of Batman's butler, very misleading <laughs> when you think about <laughs> the it. The origin of a guy. But, the uh, yeah, the, the, I, I had seen uh, some weeks ago uh, a production still from the most recent season of Pennyworth in which there are people wearing Guy Fawkes masks. And I'm like, oh, that's a funny little reference. Yeah. But apparently it's not. They're just going to... Just a lot of that. Yeah. Because <laughs> the comic itself tells an alternate future... Because it was written in the 80s. Yes. But it's set in, in the, the 90s, mid yeah. to late 90s. I always figured that's where the deviation is. Yeah. So this slide into fascism that Alan Moore was kind of, you know, afraid of. Mm. And maybe not incorrect. You know what I mean, Mason? Oh, oh it makes you think, doesn't I it? I hate to get political uh -oh. in this V for Vendetta <laughs> video. Anyways, I quite like this one. Look, I mean, it's it's certainly not the it's certainly not the worst adaptation. No. Thus far. Thus far, yeah. So, so you would rank this like below Watchmen, for example, the movie? Of the movie adaptations. I think I would, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Well, people like Watchmen, I understand That's that. That's true, yeah. yeah. And we have a video on it. That's true, way back when. Yeah, but look, forget old videos. What about new videos? What about new videos? Because here's the video we'll be covering next week. I mean, movie that we're looking at. All it takes is one bad day. The Batman. The oh, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, have you seen it? Uh, no. Yeah, you're going to love it. And maybe another animated thing. Really? We'll talk about it next week. Oh. Anyways... If you do want to see that early, you can actually head over to bigsandwich.co. And why wouldn't you, Mason? You would, though. You, you would, would, because there's early videos. Yes. There's bonus podcasts. That's correct. There's movie commentaries. Ooh. There's exclusive content. There is a massive back catalogue on there. It's like our private Patreon that goes mm. back. It, there's thousands of hours. It's That's too right. much stuff on there, and it's only available there. But if you're like, hey, I'd just rather listen to this YouTube channel and maybe your podcast, The Weekly Planet, where you talk movies and comics and TV shows, well, you can just do that. That's right. That's all you need to do. Hell yeah. All right, let's get out of here, Mason. Uh, other other uh, groups that, uh, that V for Vendetta could be revealed to be, mm -hmm. take that. Oh, yeah. Atomic Kitten. Okay. Bewitched. Yep. They were like different personalities. What was so Ronan Keating? That was it Irish. It was in Boy Zone. That was Irish, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. there's only four in that. S Club 7. How many... It doesn't really work. They have to be D-I-I yeah. for Vendetta. How many Baha men were there? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> there was just... There's so much movement. They could set all those dogs on people. That's that would true. Be there was so much movement in that video. I don't, mm. I don't remember. Yeah. That's right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Grab that jam, you guys. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>